as a woman and looking out and seeing women, not quite as many as I want to see in this room, but it is so refreshing to me year after year that we bring in these professional women in all industries. We've seen uh, women in the medical field, we've seen them in the business field and operations and sales. Uh, and for me, it's very refreshing now academia. It's just, I'm at a loss because for a long time coming, uh, women have sort of been, I don't want to say secondary, right, because we're definitely making strides, but for all the ladies in the room, uh, Dr. Erica James is here to speak with everyone, but I want you guys to listen carefully, and I'm sorry if I'm sort of pigeonholing the discussion, but it just means a lot to us uh, as women, and I'm speaking on all of your behalfs, by the way. Um, and she was appointed the Dean of the Goizueta Business School on May 19th. 2014. Her accolades speak for themselves. I'm not going to take any more of your time, but please give a round of applause for Dr. Erica James. I'll get it. Yep, there sure is somewhere here. Okay. Runaway clicker. There you go. And that should be on. And I'll get your presentation up here in just a sec. Good afternoon. How are you? I know it's been a long morning and afternoon. If you haven't had a chance to get outside, it's absolutely gorgeous today. So uh, I realize that I am the last thing between you and being outside, so we will move swiftly through this. But I don't want to shortchange you. I was asked to speak to you today about my journey and how it is that I became the dean of a business school when I didn't even know what a dean of a business school was um, when I was your age. My story, though, is not, it, it is unique in that I'm the only one that has this story, but it's not special. It's certainly not any more special or any more inspirational or any more meaningful or any more right than your story. So I, I want to preface my remarks today. Um, I will tell you my journey. I, this will be a lot about the steps that I took to be here with you today, but don't let that fool you into thinking that I've done everything right. And in fact, I will talk about some of my mistakes. As, so I'm a prof my background is as a professor. I spent the last 20 years working in academia as a professor of business administration. Um, and, and as a professor, what are, what are teachers and professors most known for doing? What? Teaching, Teaching lecturing, and at the end of that? Grading, Homework. grading <laughs> testing. So, I have a test for you. Uh, I would like for you, as I go through my journey, as I go through the story, there will be lots of images that, are, that, are, that will come up on the screen. I'd like for you to be mindful of what some of the images are that you see, because at the end I want to ask you some questions about what you saw, or what you observed, or what you can infer from those, from those images. All right, my first question, though, is about the word mentor. How many of you know the history of the word mentor? Mentor is actually from Greek mythology. And the gentleman on the left is, is, min, is a mentor who was a Greek god in the story of the Trojan War. And he was known over time for providing advice and counsel and friendship. And from that mythology, from his character, we have continued to use the word mentor and describe what it is that you all are experiencing, uh, the students, as in terms of having opportunities to engage with people who are potentially more senior than you, certainly in some cases more experienced than you, but not always, but who are opting to serve as your mentor. I have been very fortunate in my life to have a number of mentors. So this is obviously me. This is the school that I run. It's the Goizueta Business School at Emory University. Um, this is my second time at Emory. I was here as a faculty member about 15 years ago, left for a number of years, and came back as dean. And I want to tell you how I got from here to there. So this is a map, obviously, of the United States. I was actually born in a small island called Bermuda, which is off the east coast of North Carolina. My parents were American citizens, so they were living in Bermuda at the time. I was officially an American citizen, although I was not born here. They moved back to the United States to Pennsylvania. We lived there for a short period of time. My parents got divorced, and my mother and I moved to, where am I supposed to be pointing this? Moved to Missouri, St. Louis, Missouri. 
moved from Missouri. Her parents were from there, so she had an opportunity to live close to her family while she was raising me. She got remarried. My stepfather wanted to move to Texas, and so off to Texas we go. I spent the most of my formative years, junior high and high school, in Texas and had some in interesting experiences, which I will tell you about when you see the next slide. Um, but because of those experiences, I felt I wanted to try something new. I was the only person in my graduating class, high school class in Texas, to actually leave the state of Texas to go to college. I know, if you're from Texas, you would understand. Um, <laughs> but I felt like I needed a different experience, so I, I bucked the trend and went all the way to California. Now, I chose California because my parents told me that they were going to be relocating, and they had California on their top of their list, and so I thought, great, I'll apply to colleges in California, and guess what? I got into those colleges, and they decided to stay in Texas. So I don't know if that was their way of getting me out of the house, but I then left on my own, moved across the country to Texas to spend four years in college, uh, left Texas and went, left sunny, warm California, I'm sorry, and moved to Michigan, right, for graduate school. Um, Michigan was a wonderful experience, but it was very cold. Had the opportunity to do some work in an exciting city, New York. Lived in Manhattan working for American Express for a little while. Went back to Michigan to finish my PhD, and then took my first job as a professor at Tulane University in New Orleans. So I was back in the South where it was warm and, and fun. Met a man. That man was moving, which meant I was moving. So off we go to Virginia. Spent 13 years in Virginia. And then he, his company kept moving him around, and I wasn't moving anymore. So I said, fine, honey, we'll stay here. He went back to Texas. We were commuting and living apart. And then, lo and behold, Emory calls and said, how would you like to join us as the dean of the business school? So here I am, all right? Ten moves, the first nine of which happened in the first 30 years of my life. That's a lot of moves, but it's also a lot of experiences and a lot of people and a lot of opportunity. So my life, my journey, my story is a story about taking advantage of the opportunities that exist. So let me backtrack just a moment and tell you a little bit about my family. So this is my mother in the middle. She would kill me if she knew that this was the picture I could find of her uh, to put up. But uh, that's her, and the gentleman on the left is my biological father, who we were the ones that were all living in Bermuda together. They divorced when I was very young. A few years later, my mother married the gentleman on, my, on the right, Marshall Rosenberg. Notice anything? Right. <laughs> not, not really. Um, so this is when we were living in Texas, and Marshall Rosenberg was Jewish. This was in the 1980s, and being an interracial marriage in the 1980s, not only interracial but also interfaith in the 1980s, was not very popular. So when I talked about wanting to leave Texas to go someplace else, it had a lot to do with the experiences that I had growing up in Texas. I never really felt like I belonged in either camp. These days, that's changing somewhat, I'm, I'm, I'm glad to say, but at that time in my life, it was really, um, transformational for me to understand and grapple with identity issues and, and wh which camp I, I, I fit. Was I black? Was I white? Was I both? And, and how did all of that play out? <clears throat> Marshall, my stepfather, was a psychologist. And he spent his, he was a self-employed psychologist, which meant he pretty much set his hours and spent his day interacting and engaging and talking with other people and helping them work through some of their personal and life, life issues. And I kind of thought that was, that was pretty cool. So I told you I left Texas to go to California, which is where I went to college. Guess what I chose to study in college? Psychology, right? Because I was influenced by my parents, by my stepfather in particular, in terms of a professional choice. But I was also heavily influenced by all three of my parents in terms of the values and the beliefs and my work ethic, and, and that shaped me more than anything. But off to California I go, I go to a small private liberal arts school named Pomona College, where I major in psychology and had the opportunity to meet the woman on my right, or on your right, whose name is Dr. Suzanne Thompson. She was a social psychologist, and that was the first introduction that I had to really understanding and learning what psychology meant. And what I loved about Professor Thompson at the time was she was the first teacher professor who was very verbal at articulating to me the potential that she saw. 
she said, you have something special, you have a gift, and you are very good at this, and I want you to continue to work hard and pursue your efforts. And her, her saying those things to me was life-changing because it was the first time that I, that I felt someone else saw in me something that I didn't even know that I, that I had. And that confidence that she was able to instill by how she articulated, how she engaged with me was very important. Now, the other thing that I learned in college as a psychology major is that I knew that I probably wasn't going to be able to afford the lifestyle that I wanted with an undergraduate degree in psychology. So Professor Thompson was very helpful in encouraging me and helping me through the process of applying to graduate school. That's when I go to the University of Michigan. And there I met three more people who were absolutely instrumental to my development, people who I would consider to have been mentors at the time. Um, the woman on the right is the first person that I knew, first black woman that I knew who had a PhD in anything, much less a PhD in the field that I was interested in pursuing. So I spent a lot of time talking with her about how and why she made this choice and, and what I needed to do to be like her. But where I want to spend my time is with the woman at the top, Professor Sue Ashford, who eventually became the, the chairperson of my dissertation, which is basically a long book that you write uh, to show that you've studied something long enough to be able to write a book about it. And and Sue was one of those people who, at, on the surface, seemed pretty distant and aloof. But for some reason, we really connected. And I valued um, her friendship. And she was the first professor to ever invite me over to her home. So I'm seeing this woman who I admire and respect as a professional. But then I also get to see her in her home environment, interacting with her husband and her kids. And, and learning and watching that dynamic and how she was able to make the choices, I won't use the word balance, but how she was able to make the choices that she did that led to a, uh, led to a very successful personal and professional life was highly influential to me. So much so that I want to share with you something that I had a chance to do recently. This is a book be called Because You Believe in Me. And I was asked about two years ago to write a chapter for this book. And it's a book on mentors. And everyone who contributed a chapter was asked to describe a mentor and the impact that that person had on your development. So I'd like to share with you something that I, that I wrote for Sue Ashford. I wrote this as a dedication in my, in my dissertation. So this was the dedication page in my dissertation. Thank you, Sue Ashford, for helping me in invaluable ways. You, more than anyone, have mentored me and shown me the ropes. You provided opportunities for me to learn in an environment where I felt safe to, safe to test my wings. Thank you also for listening to my fears and understanding my insecurities, yet displaying unwavering support and encouragement by opening doors to a career that I was too frightened to pursue. My hope for all of you is that at some point in your life, if you don't already, you have a Sue Ashford. You find someone for whom you would be willing to write those words. And my second hope for you is that you become a Sue Ashford, such that someone one day will write those words about you because of the impact that they have had on your life. So Sue was obviously very important. And um, she was also very important in helping me make a risky choice. So when you're getting your PhD, going through graduate school, you have classes that you have to take. You have a big test called your comprehensive exam that you have to pass in order to continue. And then you have a dissertation. In between the time that I took my comprehensive exam and wrote my dissertation, I made a choice to leave the University of Michigan and see what it was like to work in the real world. So. Everyone said, don't do it, don't do it. You'll get used to making money, and you'll never go back, and you'll never finish your PhD. Sue was the one that encouraged me to go out and test my wings and to explore what it would be like to work in a more corporate setting and not just be in academia. And so because of her counsel, I moved to New York and went to work at American Express. And this Addie Williamson was my first boss at American, well, my first boss ever. Um, and she was at American Express. And the title of this slide was First Job, First Boss, First Mistake. Because it's here where I made a major error. Addie had entrusted me with a significant project. And she was going to be, she had a global assignment, so she was traveling all over the country, and so I was working pretty autonomously. And during the time, a, a trip that she was going to be gone, 
um, I was to have met with an important client and delivered the presentation and, and done uh, sort of be Addie in her absence. There were other people who were going to be there, of course, but I had a significant component of that day. That morning, I woke up and I wasn't feeling well. It was my first bout of having um, allergies, and I didn't know what it was, but I know my face had swollen and my eyes were, were, were puffy and I couldn't breathe and I was sneezing and coughing. So I made the choice not to go to work that day. Right. Bad choice. Um, I got a call around 3 o'clock in the afternoon from one of Addie's colleagues. This is a vice president at American Express saying, where are you? The client is here. We're ready for the presentation. And it didn't occur to me that I needed to call in and make arrangements for my absence. And in so doing, we, we eventually won that, that client, but we had to work probably five times as hard. And I had a lot of um, apologizing and a lot of makeup work that I needed to do. So Addie gets back in town. She hears what, what happens. And I'm obviously thinking I'm going to be fired. She didn't fire me. But she did something far more, more valuable, which was she actually gave me feedback. She talked to me and counseled me about the choice that I made, the implications that it had, the consequence that it had, and what I needed to do differently in the future in order to manage myself as a professional in a, in a corporate setting. And I've never forgotten those lessons. And I've never not shown up for any commitment since then. I did go back to Michigan. I did finish my PhD. And I took my first academic job at Tulane University. And the, remember, you're supposed to be paying attention to the images, right? Don't forget. Um, the gentleman that you see is Professor Art Brief. He was my first academic um, professional mentor. He was uh, someone who worked in my department. He was obviously much more senior than I was, knew the ropes, and took me under his wing as the assistant professor who he was going to help ensure made it in the academic field. He grew quite fond of me, and um, I grew close to his family, and we spent a lot of time together. We wrote papers together. He taught me how to teach and all sorts of wonderful things. Um, but he was very clear. He said, Erica, as much as I may love you, when it comes down to evaluating you, there's no freebie. You have a standard. We have standards, and you will be measured against those standards, regardless of our personal relationship. Again, that was another lesson that I took to heart, that I can be friends with people, that I can have a very good relationship, and still have expectations of delivering when it comes to performance. So I told you that I met a man, and this would be that man. Uh, and what's interesting is that I chose to go the academic route and become a professor. And he works in the corporate world. He works for a major oil company. And I call him, I refer to him as my leadership guru, because he does all of the things that I study and teach. Right? Um, and I, there were times when I would call him at his office, and he would always answer the phone for me, even if he couldn't speak at that moment. He'd answer the phone and put me on pause or hold or something, but I could still hear what was happening in his office in the background. And I don't know if he was doing that intentionally, but I learned how he interacted and how he managed and how he communicated with the people that he worked with. And so while I'm on hold, I'm listening and I'm learning from him, and he's not even aware that how I become a leader, he is exactly what I wanted to, implement, to, to exemplify as a leader. He could be tough, he could be stern, he, have, he could have high expectations, but he could also really understand the human being that was in front of him and have uh, a level of empathy for them that was highly valuable. And so I feel very fortunate that I get to watch and learn from him and his, experience as a, his experiences as a corporate leader as I now try to do the work that I do where I'm leading hundreds of people. So finally, uh, I moved to the University of Virginia. And that's where I spent the last 13 years before moving back to Atlanta. And I have three pictures here. One was my boss. He was the person who I learned how to be a dean from, because he was the dean of the business school at the University of Virginia. And he gave me a number of opportunities to demonstrate my own capabilities in leading people and leading parts of the, parts of the business school. Uh, I have up here my colleague Martin Davidson. 
who was a friend. He and I were almost the same age. We were the same level in the organization, but I considered him a mentor because I learned different things from him, but I also had a friendship with him, a work friendship that was valuable. It made me enjoy going to work every day because I knew I had a friend in the business, if you will. And then lastly, I have a picture of my friend Kristen Bafar, who was junior to me at the University of Virginia. She was several years younger age-wise, but also several years newer in the profession of the academy. And I learned a tremendous amount from her, even though she had less time in the field than I did. I will say that these three and all of the people that I've shared with you have helped me pursue a life that leads me to, he to be here with you this afternoon. But in the time leading up to my being dean, these three were absolutely the most instrumental because they believed in me and they were the ones saying, you have an opportunity, you must take that opportunity. We know you're afraid, we know you're scared, but we also know you can do it. We believe in you. And so they were pushing me when Emory called and said, would you like to become the next dean? I was reticent, I was hesitant, I didn't think I had what it take. I didn't know very many other women business school deans. Um, and yet these three were the, one that pushed me over the, were the ones that pushed me over the edge to take on this new challenge. And so that is how I became, I did eventually learn what a dean does, um, but that is how I became the dean of Great Boys Wider Business School. Now it may surprise you to learn that I haven't stopped learning. And I'm learning now from very different people. These are my children, Jordan and Alexandra. Jordan is 13, he'll be 14 next week, and Alexandra is age 11. And as a parent now, I'm amazed at how much I learn from my children. Their experiences, their conversations with their friends, how they approach and view the world. There's a beautiful naivete that I think is important for adults to remember. And I could dismiss them because they're 11 and 14 and they're in those tween years and you know that's not always a bastion of, of um, <laughs> positive behavior. Um, yet, they're, they're soulful and they're wise in, in important ways and I would advise all of the adults in the room to pay attention to what we can learn from the younger generation. All right, are you ready for the test? Yes. What are some things that you observed about the images that I shared with you? Yes, sir. They were all really good. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Duly noted, all right. What else? Diversity. Yes, ma'am. Diversity. Diversity, say more. Different race, different cultures, different ages, different experience levels, right? So it's very easy to assume that we can only learn from a dominant group. We can only be mentored by a dominant group. And I will tell you that it has been my experience that you can learn and grow and advance uh, from a wide array of sources, a wide array of people and talent. So I would encourage you to stay open to being mentored by anybody, okay? Anything else that you observed? They looked happy. I, that's a very good point. Uh, I, I would strongly encourage you to seek relationships uh, that add positivity, that add value to your life. I, the people that I, that I showed here, I have had to um, remove myself from negative relationships over the course of my my, my life, and I say the ones that here are those people who contributed positively, and they were able to contribute positively to me because, in fact, they were satisfied and happy in their own lives. So I would seek out people who are, who are already happy. Any other observations? Yes. Well, let me go to the next slide because I have an answer to that on the, on the next slide. So the, the question was, most of the people that I shared that are in my network of mentor relationships are people that I already had a relationship with. And his question was, what advice would I give if, um, for someone who's going out to seek a mentor 
with someone that they don't already know or already have a relationship with. And so I would say what I've said already, be open to learning from anyone. Here's the answer to that question. Mentoring is mutual, right? It's not only about taking from your mentor, taking their advice, taking their counsel, taking their time, but it's about what you can give back. Okay? The expectation, you will find a much richer mentor relationship when your mentor feels as if they're getting something out of the relationship. So you must come to the table and be able to offer something. Right? It's not just about taking, but it's about being, being able to give. <clears throat> Uh, another key lesson, mentors can serve a variety of roles. We often think of as a mentor as someone who can help us advance in our career. They can certainly do that, but I've described people who were friends to me, and I got a great deal of social support. That is just as important as career guidance, just as important as academic guidance, just as important as the, um, the, the information that someone else has that I might not be privy to. It's been my experience that the most valuable mentoring relationships occur naturally. I will say that many schools, many universities, many organizations are, put, are, are promoting and developing, um, and this one is, is an example, highly successful um, mentoring programs. So you might not naturally uh, engage in a relationship and that develop into a mentor. You might be put together with someone who will become your mentor. And in those circumstances, the most important thing that you can do is to get to know each other outside of the context that you are put together in. So if it's a work program or a school program and you get assigned a mentor at one of those locations, get out of the work office, get out of the, the school location, and do something, learn about each other in ways that aren't just connected to school or to work. That's how relationships form, that's how relationships are, are developed in meaningful ways, and that's where the value comes in from the mentoring. And then lastly, as I learned from my mentors, when someone gives you a chance, take it. Don't hold back. Thank you very much. Hey guys, I think this is too cool of an opportunity to pass up. Let's take two questions. Two, I know you've got questions. There's a question over here. Where's the mic? All right, so many things going on. Here I come for you with the mic. Hello, my name is Hewitt Tedros. Um, you say that you've had a bunch of mentors and you've, all, you've been able to use them in different capacities. Have you been able to keep in contact with them? And if so, how? Yes, great question. Uh, every single one of them I still have a relationship with. Now, I, I've, I've obviously moved, uh, but so I don't see them as often. But we, the relationships were so strong that we stay connected via phone, via Email, I'm not a big Facebook user, so I don't use a lot of social media for those kinds of relationships. Um, but there are times when we're just connecting, usually via phone or, or email. We just find ways to make sure that that relationship stays in touch. And I would say that is a critical, critical component to your development. Don't lose those relationships, especially if they're meaningful, especially if they're adding value. Find ways to continue to stay in touch. Really great question. One more. I don't know whose hand went up first. Come in. Don't lose that question. Hi. So I had a question kind of um, more about your like experience getting to where you are. Did you find that there were any specific like issues that you faced as a woman in this particular field or especially as a woman of color in this field? Uh, certainly. The, I remember when I went to the University of Virginia and I had just had my first child the first year that I started there. And that was a school at the time that was dominated, the business school at least, was dominated by male faculty, most of whom were married and had wives that didn't work. So I was kind of an anomaly in that setting. And um, I remember my faculty making comments like, oh, well, what are your children doing while you're at work? And they must love the nanny more than they love you, right? So those were not easy things to hear, and they were very distracting as I'm trying to, to be a professional in that context. So yes, there were those kinds of examples that um, made it more challenging and more difficult. Um, 
there were clearly, I think someone of, of my age, and, and I hope it's getting less and less, um, but I know that it still exists. There are acts of subtle and, and sometimes obtuse forms of discrimination, and so we, we face that still. Um, but I'll say that the biggest struggles that I had were in here, not what was happening around me. And it was more about the doubt that I had in myself and my not believing in myself enough to, to think that I was ready for the next big thing, um, my not asking for what I thought I deserved, my thinking that I needed to do much, much more than anyone else because I had so much more to prove, um, my thinking that I needed to act like the male colleagues, like my male professors who um, you know, were getting great teaching ratings and whatnot, that I needed to go in and I needed to pound on the desks and, and look macho and all that stuff like they were doing. And I realized that that's not me. And the more I tried to act like something that I wasn't, the worse my performance was. So um, I had to get out of my own head and realize you know, whatever external barriers are out there, the, f the ones that are far more challenging are the ones that I've put in my head about why I can't or shouldn't or why I'm not good enough. So. Yes. Um, Dean, uh, <clears throat> Dean James, we're honored that you're here along with some amazing speakers that we've had today. Um, one thing that I noticed in your presentation is that the mentors that you interacted with were all very supportive of you and encouraging, and it sounds like you sought those types of people versus like naysayers and so forth. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, and I don't think that was, so that I think that's true. It's not something that I was doing consciously, but I think subconsciously I found myself attracted to people who were positive people, who had their own thing going on and who were happy to your question, who were satisfied because they were able to um, to, to share that kind of positivity with me, and I found that much more alluring than people who had a, more of a negative spirit about them. So I think it's very important to surround yourself with positive people, and I think it's important, although difficult, to cut ties with people who are, who are not helping you be your best. So. Thank you. Thank you guys so much. so much. Thank you.